Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Alex, and I will be one of your service leaders today. We do hope you feel welcome here. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a, a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, including diversity of beliefs from divine believers to humanists, from pagans to atheists and agnostics. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search of meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. For many of us, the verdict in the Colton Bushi case shook us to our core. Others are outraged, enraged, even fearful. The verdict is a step back in the journey towards reconciliation, a big step backwards. In 2014, Canadian Unitarians, through our expression of reconciliation, pledged to be in solidarity with our Indigenous siblings in spirit, and we committed to the journey of healing and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Our thoughts are with the family of Colton Bushi and with Indigenous people across Canada who have lived through situations like this countless times. We acknowledge we are only just beginning to feel the deep grief that comes with the work of reconciliation. As we do with anyone in our community that is grieving, let us turn our attention to those who need us now, our Indigenous siblings in spirit. As Canadian Unitarians, let them hear from us that we know they are not alone. Let us reach out to our local communities and offer our deep condolences for what they must be going through. Let us bring food, send cards, show up at local events being organized. Let us reach out to our indigenous neighbors and ask what they need at this time. Let us begin conversations with our neighbors. Let us raise our voices to the call on our government demanding a review of the judicial system that continues to fail indigenous people all across the country. Let us support a government that is calling for change to jury selection. Let us pressure that government to appeal the verdict. Let us rage, hold one another, pray, and march. Most of all, let us show up. The path of truth and reconciliation is and will be a long one, generations long. Let us do what we can to ensure that the path grows ever smoother as we and those who will follow continue the journey. Blessings, and it's signed by the Reverend Samaya Oakley. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. For those who are visiting or have not been part of this series, we've been spending uh, January and February looking at indigenous issues and our relationship of the dominant culture to the people who were here first. The way that I've been approaching it in the sermon portion of the series is to look at the seven sacred teachings that come along with the medicine wheel. Today we're doing two, humility and wisdom. And as I've been doing in this sermon series, each section begins with a reading from Dave Corshane and Cindy Crow that describes the spirit animal and the basic teaching. And then I add in my own remarks. So the reading... Humility is represented by the wolf. In the natural world, the wolf expresses humbleness very clearly. The wolf lives within a pack of other wolves. The pack operates as a team. 
Each animal has a role within this pack that they have to play. Several animals may be hunters, some will be nurturers, some will be protectors, and others will be the pups that follow along and learn and grow. And no animal is more important than any of the others, as each animal must perform the role that it has for survival in the betterment of the pack. Each animal within the pack is very important, and thus none is really better than the other. When the wolf comes up to another larger creature, it will bow its head, not out of fear, but out of humbleness. He humbles himself in your presence. A wolf that has hunted food will take this food back to the den and eat with the pack before he takes his first bite. The act of sharing from one animal to another is shown clearly in this example. The animals must share for the survival of the pack. In this way, the wolf becomes the teacher of this lesson. He bows his head in the presence of others out of deference. Once hunted, he will not take food until it can be shared with the pack. His lack of arrogance and respect for his community is a hard lesson, but integral to the Aboriginal way. Nine days ago, a very large part of our country was shocked and outraged by the, ver- by the verdict acquitting Gerald Stanley of committing any crime in the killing of Colton Bushy. I think that the pastoral letter from our Canadian UU Ministers Association capt- captured many of our Unitarian thoughts pretty well. Looking at the evidence that has come out during and after the trial, it's very hard to see this as anything but a racially motivated verdict. It should be appealed. The process of justice seeking should not be abandoned yet. Let us celebrate the potential of the rule of law to right this wrong. In the United States, a decision like this in Ferguson, Missouri, and other cities sparked days of rioting from very angry, oppressed peoples. But that has not happened here. The Bushy family chose another path. Last Sunday, Cheryl Whiskeyjack spoke from this pulpit. She's the executive director of the Bent Arrow Society here in Edmonton. And she said that her entire weekend had been spent texting or conversing about this travesty. She noted the anger and despair that she felt, but she also found cause for hope. The response from outraged Canadians across the country, people who are very... would likely be very comfortable in a Unitarian community like ours, that gave her hope. The response of the Bushi family, dignified in their grief and anger and determined to bring peaceful change and improvement, that gave her hope. The Bushi clan chose to follow the path of the wolf. They chose to follow the sacred teachings that we have been exploring, and especially in this case, the path of humility. Let me tell you a story. An old grandfather said to his young grandson who came to him with anger at a schoolmate who had done an injustice, let me tell you the story, the grandfather begins. I too at times have felt great hate for those who have taken so much with no sorrow, no sorrow for what they have done. But hate wears you down and does not hurt your enemy. It is like taking poison and wishing that your enemy would die. I have struggled with these feelings at times. He continued, It is as if there are two wolves inside of me. One is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all that is around him and does not take offense when offense is not intended. He will only fight when it is right to do so and in the right way. Ah, but the other wolf, he is full of anger. The littlest thing will set him into a fit of temper. He fights everyone all the time for no reason. He cannot think because his anger and his hatred are so great that they blur his thoughts. It is helpless anger, for his anger will change nothing. Sometimes it is difficult to live with these two wolves inside of me, for each of them tries to dominate my spirit. 
The boy looked intently into his grandfather's eyes and asked, Which one wins, grandfather? The grandfather smiled and said, The one I feed, son, the one I feed. The Bushi family chose to feed the pack wolf, the one that prefers the path of harmony. Instead of riots, there were meetings with the prime minister and every cabinet minister who is responsible for any piece of portfolio of either justice or indigenous relations. The path of humility does not ask us to surrender our anger or our grief, but it does ask us to turn to the community, to be open to collective wisdom. It asks us to do the part that is our gift and our ability to do. Like, it asks us to do that, and most importantly, to not let the angry wolf take over and drive our actions. I am in awe of the Bushi family and the community that surrounds them. And I am not sure that I would have been able to show such restraint. A reading concerning wisdom represented by the beaver. To live in wisdom is to know and understand that the Great Spirit gave everyone special gifts. When we know and use our gifts, we become an instrument of the Great Spirit, helping to bring peace to our world. Showing wisdom is using your gifts to build a peaceful and healthy family and community. Political. The wisdom of the people in council is also respected. Once you give an idea to a council or a meeting, it no longer belongs to you. The idea now belongs to the people. Wisdom demands that you listen intently to the ideas of others in council and that you do not insist that your idea is the best or that it prevails. Indeed, you should freely support the ideas of others because even if those ideas are quite different from the ones that you have contributed, if they are true, they will prevail and be respected. The clash of different ideas brings forth the spark of truth. Once a council has decided something in unity, consensus, wisdom demands that no one speak secretly against what has been decided. If the council made an error, that error will become apparent to everyone in its own time. The beaver. The building of a community is entirely dependent on the gifts given to each member of the community by the Great Spirit. These gifts must be utilized for the betterment of the community. And the beaver represents that building. The beaver's example of using his special gifts that he has received, his sharp teeth for cutting trees and branches, which he uses to build dams and lodges, expresses this teaching. Because If the beaver did not use his gift to build, his teeth would grow and grow, ultimately making it impossible for him to sustain himself and it would ultimately lead to his demise. The beaver knows his gifts and knows that he has to use them to the best of his abilities. Humans. It is said to be the same for human beings. If we do not use our gifts, our spirits will become weak and are not fulfilling their use. The denial eventually leads to sickness because each human being's special gifts help impart self-worth and identity. Therefore, when we use our special gifts properly and how the Great Spirit intended, these gifts contribute to the development of a peaceful and healthy community. When we don't use them or when they are suppressed or we are not allowed to use them, our spirits grow sick. When we use them for a healthy community, our spirits grow strong and good, just as our community will. We have become an impatient lot. It is the information age. We've come to believe that we can find any piece of knowledge we want with a click or two of a mouse pad. Of course, 
Almost everyone who's tried to answer a question on a government website knows that this is often not true. However, there is a conviction out there that a quick ser Google search will turn any person into an instant expert. Similarly, we look to our Facebook and Twitter feeds and such to find interpretations and opinions. And unfortunately, there is a growing tendency to only look or to be fed, in the case of Facebook, opinions and ideas that support our own. The ideas we accept as instant experts are often narrowly conceived, and we don't see the opposing viewpoint. Our societies become less interested in the free flow of ideas and more interested in having our idea winning. This is not the wise course. It is not the path of wisdom. It is the path of partisanship. It is the path of isolation. Isolated ideas get stored in silos, but not the ones that store healthy grain. No, they get stored in the silos that are designed to hold missiles to be launched at the enemies who think differently from you. In the social media age, we've learned that everyone has a right to talk and a right to post, but so many of us have forgotten to listen and to read and to learn and to weigh options. The historic unwillingness to listen to the stories and wisdom of indigenous peoples is what got us into this social and political mess in the first place. Instead, long before social media, the leaders of Canada spoke only amongst themselves and made decisions for peoples and cultures they did not understand nor appreciate. That was not the wise path. The Unitarian minister and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, and this is a popular paraphrase, wisdom was experience passed through the fire of thought. Experience is the key word here. Experience means actually living through something, looking at it from all sides. Experience is not gained by judging something from afar, listening to siloed opinions of others. Experience is so much more than clicking a button or reading an unwise report. A subject deeply studied brings experience that we often call expertise. It develops a skill that is useful in the wider community. A life lived with ups and downs, represented by our candles, that's experience burning right there on the tables in front of you. These things teach us about which ideas have merit and which ideas are deeply flawed. But the critical part of the story is passing those experiences through the fire of thought, not just making instant judgments or drawing instant conclusions based on one person saying, oh, you should think this way. That's the bringer of wisdom, passing it through the fire of thought, the reflection on what we have seen and felt. That deeper thought teaches us compassion, for we begin to understand the stories and the trials of others. And again, I find myself back visiting the Vushi family and how they also demonstrated the path of the beaver. From the reading, the wisdom of the people in council is also respected. Once you bring an idea to a council or a meeting, it no longer belongs to you. The idea now belongs to the people. Wisdom demands that you listen intently to the ideas of others in council and that you do not insist that your idea is the best or that it prevail. The Bushis turned to the political leaders of the land and asked for action. They turned to us, the dominant majority, who look a lot more like the jury than any of them do, and they asked us to join them on the wisdom-seeking path. They did not just consult the angry and hurt people who felt just like them. They understood that the decision made by such a narrowly defined community might not lead to the wisest course. And having offered their views, they waited and listened for the sharing of wisdom. We're still waiting. We'll see how it turns out. Wisdom does not come from seeking people who think just like you, and wisdom does not come from only speaking. It comes from listening. 
listening to many voices and voices that are different from your own, listening to the stories of others, trying to find the wisdom they have gleaned by examining their lives. Last week, Cheryl Whiskey Jack took a few questions after her presentation, and one of them came from one of our youth. She said, what can we young people do to help? And Cheryl chose the path of the beaver. She said, just keep talking and listening to other young people, especially to the ones who are different from you in background or outlook. She urged that youth to keep sharing stories and to listening to stories, to genuinely learn about the people she meets along the way. I noted in the first sermon in this series that young people today in many parts of this country are learning the true history of the indigenous peoples in a way that most people over 40 years of age never did. Unlike their elders, the kinds of elders who populated this infamous journey, they won't have to unlearn the privileged and racially prejudiced history we did. There was hope there. But there's also a path towards wisdom there. Amen. Our chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts, the souls of each one of you, where you're called upon to use your gifts to make this world a better place in whatever way you can. So please share the love of this chalice, the light of this chalice with those you know, those you love, and those you've yet to meet.